This is Keyed In with Max and Brent, unlocking the minds of the industry's top real estate professionals. And now, here are your hosts, Max Rabin and Brent Jackson. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Keaton Podcast. I'm your host, Max Rabin. And this week, we have a guest host, Mattia Defuso. Welcome to the show. Hey, Max. Glad to be here today. So, Mattia, you're on Brent's team. Brent is uh, away on vacation um, doing, we don't know, always something. Something uh, fun. <laughs> something <for sure>. fun. <laughs> usually something fun. And that's great. Um, and you've been on the show before. Uh, you were one of our early guests. Yeah, right? I think third. Third probably. guest. There yeah. you go. So, uh, welcome. And uh, today we have Tamor Loinab. Uh, Tamor is um, in new condo sales in Washington, D.C. I've done a few deals with you. And um, you're like, uh, you're, I mean, new sales, when I think of uh, new condo sales, you're one of the first names that comes up in Washington, D.C. You're very kind. Thank you. Definitely. I'm happy to be here with both of you. Um, so let's just jump right in. I, my, I guess my first question for you is, uh, were you always in new condo sales or did like when you first started out in real estate? Um, did you, were you in resales to start? Just go ahead. Uh, so I, I have actually been with the same firm for the entirety of my career. And this is 16 plus years now. I mm-hmm. started with McWilliams Ballard, mm-hmm. um, really knowing nothing about nothing, uh, but particularly nothing about real estate. Uh, and um, I, as many people do, I kind of stumbled into this career. Uh, I was in another life. I was a writer reporter. Um, covering Congress and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it was the first job I had uh, immediately after uh, graduate school. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was uh, working wire copy uh, for BNN News, um, doing beat reporting for them. Uh, so it forced me to be nocturnal. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we would go to print at an ungodly time of like 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. Uh, and, um, nobody tells you when you are in, in journalism school and J school that what a, a notoriously poor paying profession print journalism is going to be, uh, until, one of those noble professions. It, well, <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and for me, frankly, the romance of being poor and hungry faded pretty quickly, quickly. Yeah. um, that and, and a near kind of fatal car accident. Um, so I, I was in, I, I had just, we had just published, um, uh, my newsroom was in McLean, uh, and I was driving back. Um, it was within less than two minutes from my home. Uh, it was a two-lane road. There was construction on on both sides, uh, and uh, I fell asleep for a split second. Uh, I woke up, uh, and I was on the opposite lane of traffic, and I could see there was a car in the distance coming right towards me. I panicked. I swerved. And literally, my my beat up Mazda flew into thankfully um, a, a mound of dirt that was part of this new uh, townhome community to the right, um, and that's when I thought, oh my gosh, something something's got to give here, something's got to change because I was I was working for BNN uh, doing wire copy, I was freelancing for every paper uh, under the sun in mm-hmm. the city, and the going rate at the time was something ridiculous like. 10 cents a word. I was working with papers like local papers like Voice of the Hill um, that covered that Capitol Hill community uh, just to kind of maintain a varied portfolio because the writing I was doing was so nuanced. It was exclusively for um, a a government readership. Um, And I I had a part time gig on top of that just to make rent, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was the oldest. in a family of, of three kids and you know my folks immigrated from from Afghanistan so I had significant you know responsibilities to to my family as well um, and I had friends frankly in the real estate business these were great guys uh, who were doing very very well uh, and I love them but they barely passed high school so I, I was looking at them thinking what am I doing wrong um, and so Ross McWilliams, uh, one of the principals of McWilliams Ballard, um, I always say, uh, caught me, uh, I think, at either the right moment or a weak moment uh, and said, hey, why don't you come work with me? Um, and so I, uh, I, I, I bit the bullet and said I would. And 16 plus years later, here we are. Right? So that's how I started. So 
you know, Ross invited you and interviewed you. Did you ever, before starting in new construction with McWilliams Valor, did you ever think, oh, let me try maybe resale first or let me interview with somebody else in that? Uh, you section? know, no. Uh, I wish I had, um, I wish I had put that kind of thought process into it. I, frankly, I didn't. Uh, and um, I, I came into the business uh, just as the market was turning. Uh, and one of the things I realized very early on um, with McWilliams Ballard and with new home sales in particular was unlike some of the other jobs uh, I had done, whether it would be journalism or I at one point toyed with going to law school and then I actually worked at a law firm, um, which was a great experience. But I think every attorney sat me down and said, don't do it. It is soul crushing. You know, so I, I saw kind of the palpable um, um, uh, unhappiness that some of these attorneys, at least in firm culture, had. So I, th I thought, okay, uh, maybe I need to pivot. And that pivot, without a lot of thought, was going to graduate school for journalism. Um, and then, you know, without too much thought, I again stumbled into into this career in real estate. But what I learned early on um, was in new home sales because. Um, we were coming off of such a hot market. I mean, it was a time when developers would put up buildings and literally they would have a launch party and people would be at these parties flashing their checkbooks, right? I mean, you would have, there was a- 2006 it, era. Yeah, it was, it was two, 2006 is when I got into it, but okay. the, the, the height of that uh, development frenzy was that 2003 to 2006 yeah. when buildings were going up and they were going up quickly um, it, it, they didn't give much consideration to the quality of what they were putting up because there was so much demand uh, and there was a huge investor flipper element because everybody wanted to get rich quick through real estate um, and so you had at, at least in the new home sales market you had a, a uh, an agent um, or quality of agent who had just become accustomed to being well-paid order takers in my book. They really never had to work for a sale. They never had to court a sale. People came to them. Um, I, of course, in my uh, infinite wisdom and luck, got into it, again, just as the market was turning. Um, and I didn't know any better. So I had to really hustle for it. Uh, but it was a great education. I, it gave me an opportunity to really learn the business. Again, I knew nothing about real estate. I had a few sources in the real estate industry, people like Jim Abdo, um, whom I did stories about, um, but otherwise really didn't know much about anything. Uh, but I saw it as an opportunity, uh, and it's something that I uh, essentially evolved with. And the very first project I was on was with a very Season. I mean, he's a veteran agent, a, a former partner at a law firm, smart, smart guy. But again, um, he, he was accustomed to a different market, uh, and he wasn't accustomed to showing up seven days a week and taking appointments and making the presentation and building relationships with buyers. And uh, in part, I had to do it because it, it was him and me, and if he wasn't doing it, I had to do it. But I saw an opportunity there, and I uh, eventually, within a few months, ended up taking over this project. Uh, Which one was it? <laughs> it was 1010 Mass. 1010 Mass, yeah. okay. Uh, it was my that's, great, that's a great building. It was my first building. It's still, to date, one of my favorite buildings. Um, but that's how I started my career. Okay. Yeah, with that building, and I went from kind of, it, frankly, when I started, I was just the assistant, I wasn't even licensed, right? So I got licensed very quickly. Uh, and that became my project. And I ran with it. And that's how I established myself. How long did it take to sell that project out from the like, beginning to end? Do you, do you recall? Oh, gosh. How many uh, units? Uh, 1010 was 144 units. Uh, and it definitely took a couple of years. Um, it was a project that McWilliams Ballard had actually taken over from a, a rival company uh, and they had a number of sales I, I think the large majority of those sales never went to closing again there was such a huge investor element um, in the market at that time uh, so a lot of those sales simply fell through yeah, so the we tie in the tie in there with that era of the market is like the big short literally it's absolutely right i mean absolutely. so because the money yeah. was coming so cheap and people were thinking like 
uh, I'm going to buy a condo. Like there's all these new condos going up. I better get in now. Yes. It's really big feeding frenzy. Yeah. The financing was like, you would literally sign one piece of paper and you got well, the money. The, the joke was y you didn't even need a pulse to qualify for a loan. <laughs> That's how easy the money was. I, I bought a new condo in that era, um, Delancey Lofts, which yeah. is a building in Adams Morgan, yeah. Washington, D.C. And um, it, uh, I was under contract for it for like not, not almost a year while they were building it. And um, when I got the um, appraisal back, the appraisal came in at about 125% of the contract value. <laughs> so I actually got money back at the settlement. That's amazing. That's okay. Yeah. And I mean, I, it took, look, the place was not worth that much. <laughs> it wasn't worth the, the contract price, right. but it was just, that was the money. It was the time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was, was the time. Um, and so it, 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 at the time, I, uh, I didn't realize how fortunate I was to get in when I got in because it, Again, not only did opportunities open up for me, but because the market had turned and because there was now a work ethic involved, right? There was um, some thought and some competency and a level of professionalism that was required in order to to um, really sell these buildings and represent these buildings. Um, it, uh, it it helped me not only learn the business but also kind of craft my own personal sales style, which I think is important for any one of us, you know, in, in, in this business, you have to know a, who you are, you have to know what your personal selling style is and you have to really lean into that. Um, and so that's, that's what that initial experience taught me. I guess it was a good one. If you stuck with it, right? The first building, uh, it, you mostly. know, it, it, look, it wasn't without its challenges. Um, and it's still not without its challenges, but, I don't know of any other profession that I could have pursued, um, and, and I, was, I was young then, uh, where I would have been able to um, really dictate my own success, right? Um, I couldn't have done it in journalism. Uh, I know I couldn't have done it in law. Uh, but here was an opportunity where, um, depending on how much I wanted to put into this, how hard I wanted to work, how much I wanted to show up, how hard I wanted to hustle, I could control my own professional destiny. And that's what I learned very early on. And I think that is why it has worked for me. And this is why this collaboration now, 16 plus years with McWilliams Ballard, I think has been a really uh, successful one um, because I, I have been able to um, essentially control my professional destiny. Let's walk through a little bit um, what it's like to, uh, when you take on a new project as a listing agent or a listing team, uh, obviously McWilliams Ballard has certain clients that like you guys are tied together for many years that yeah. when they have a new project, like you're like McWilliams Ballard is the first call. So, and there are different agents, you, there are other brokers at McWilliams Ballard that work on different projects. Sure. So, so how do, how does the broker know that they're going to put Tamor on the project for, for starters? Uh, that's a good question. It's probably a better question for, for Ross McWilliams or Chris Ballard, but I think, um, for starters, uh, I think I'm fortunate in that I get repeat business. So if there are uh, clients who are, um, going another round in the rodeo, for example, and I, we've worked together, uh, it's usually a successful project, um, then they come to me. I also, again, early on in my career, built a reputation of being kind of the cleanup guy. So when other firms or agents couldn't sell a building, um, I, I remember um, 1010 Mass again, um, our big rival at the time, 1010 Mass, in terms of new buildings was the Metropole. And the Metropole had changed uh, listing agents a few times over. Uh, we were near sellout at, at uh, 1010 Mass, and they they didn't understand why and and 1010 mass at the time was kind of a no man's land you know it was half a block away from k street but it's not in logan circle it's not in penn quarter correct city center right. was was just a dream at that time that we were selling um the um uh the, the marriott marquee i mean our, our, my sales trailer was uh there and okay. next to that pepco building so it, there was nothing there uh and uh we did really well 
you know, and the Metropole was the more sought after location. The Whole Foods was there. Uh, Vita Fitness was opening up uh, and they didn't understand um, why sales were languishing there. Uh, and, uh, and so then they came to me uh, and I took over that project um, and turned that project around and that became a huge success. So then I got this reputation if, if you're having problems or trouble selling a building, come to this guy um, because you know he has some magic and I had no magic. It was just, <laughs> you know. Yeah, we get those calls too. Like, and, um, and we might have taken one over from you, I think. Yeah, that's right. And, um, <laughs> that's right. And, and I was happy to do it. And, and in fact, the developers, I, I, this was an 11th Street project. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I also believe, look, I, I think two things. I think one, uh, the pie is big enough for everyone. Sure. And I think you do what you can, right, for, for a project. Uh, and you put everything you have into it. And, and sometimes it simply doesn't work out. And sometimes your clients... Um, have drank so much of their Kool-Aid that they can't see the forest from the trees. So the project that you're talking about, I, I know well, and um, they it, inherently the issue there was they put their priciest, they created their priciest units out of basement units, yeah, yeah. townhomes. Let, and you don't need to name names. No, but, no, no. But correct, but, correct. Yes. So at the point where they were like, you know, Tamar, we need to switch gears. You're probably like, fine. Because those I was are the toughest happy. To sell. You know, I remember the exact conversation, Max, because I said, you know what? Sometimes the best thing for a project can be getting an infusion of new blood, yeah. right? Uh, and sometimes that does the trick. Um, and other times they realize that they're basement units that are overpriced. And, uh, you know, I saw what happened there. And, and it was, it's ultimately, it's a price you've got to make. The market tells you very early on what's going to move and what isn't and why. Uh, and you either move with the market or you you suffer, you languish on the market. So okay, it's- Well, okay, that's a but okay, segue question yes, here please. Um, about just not that project specifically, yeah, but yeah. projects in general. So so they're like, okay, um, we're gonna be listing, you know, X amount of units. Um, we've got these plans in place, et cetera. And you go and have a meeting with them when they already have their floor plans and everything. Mm -hmm. And you start looking at these plans, and you're going, oh my God. Why did they put like a two thousand square foot unit in the basement? You know, when when they yeah. had like a brand new footprint, right? There's always some reason. There's always, yeah. It's it's but, tough. You know, sometimes it it, it it depends on when I get my hands on a project or when I'm brought on to exactly. a project. Sometimes you're so far into it, there's nothing you can do. Uh, but there are other times where I can come in and I can see red flags. You know, um, early on around that time, there was this big movement. Um, uh, to uh, a doing smaller spaces and doing a lot of interior bedrooms that freaked a lot of people out. Right, right? Uh, now interior bedrooms have become commonplace. In part, it's because when when developers get these buildings, they're like puzzle pieces, and they're always looking to maximize their space, their floor plans, and their price per square foot. There's a whole array of reasons that go into it, but. Um, Interior bedrooms, we had <laughs> developers that they, they had buildings where they designed buildings with windows that didn't open. And I thought, why the hell would you do that? We've got to change that. So that's a change I implemented. I added uh, transoms to these interior bedrooms and strategically placed transoms to bring light sources. You know, sometimes, you know, you need a third set of eyes um, to point out some very conspicuous design flaws. But and also you're the agent, you're the person who's really facing up with the mm -hmm. consumers constantly. So you're gonna find out immediately what yes. the consumers are reacting to negatively or positively. Light's a big one. Yeah, light's a big one. Yeah. And I think that's really important. I, well, that's really how I see my role. I'm, I am the clients, and in my case, many, many instances, I represent sellers, you know, builder, developer, they're inter interchangeable, and I'm their eyes and ears, right? Uh, and the purpose of having me there, um, uh, and I'm a, a big proponent of the hard hat phase. Uh, I like being in the building for a lot of reasons, uh, including gauging timelines for delivery and things like that, but also getting people into the tangible spaces. That experience is, is, is vital in terms of maintaining sales pace because it makes a project real for a prospective buyer. Without it, it's very challenging to simply sell off of floor plans. Um, Going off of that, I've 
dealt with you on, on you know on the buy side and mm-hmm. you know every time i brought a buyer to you whether it's at the beginning of the project or towards the end you know a year into it your presentation of the project is so energetic and so polished that in my head i'm always thinking how is he still so excited about this project you know a year and a half later where we're selling you know now the worst units because the good <laughs> ones have all sold yeah. and it's you know and he's presenting this presentation to the buyers that is so exciting that they get excited yeah. but i'm thinking where does he get you know on day you know 300 the same energy and the same yeah. excitement about a certain project well a i owe it to my clients to to bring my a game every time uh, i owe it to uh the prospective purchasers to their agents to make this the best experience possible. Um, And to be perfectly honest, when I take on a project, um, it's a strange saying it, but it's like having a kid, right? Um, Your kid could be the ugliest kid in the world, but it's still your kid. Mm -hmm. And I'd be damned if anybody's going to call my kid ugly, right? So that's really how I I approach these buildings. I, I believe in the project. Uh, and so that is what you're seeing. I, I, I hope what is being conveyed is um, is an earnestness, right? Um, that I believe so strongly in this project, uh, in this product, that I think you should invest in it, that you should make this your home. And what's the longest project, by the way, that you've been oh, gosh. attached to? Um, uh, there are projects that have just dragged on. I think you're still on one. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but again, yes, I am. It's, sometimes they can be three, four year. Wow. Uh, and, and simply because there are uh, delays associated yeah. with this. You know, yeah. I get involved sometimes, not always, but I get involved uh, before uh, a project is even a hole in the ground. I mean, that's how early that some clients have to start. You know, we have to create um, a sales presence and a momentum to keep their investors and their lenders happy. Um, and, uh, and I think that's the other thing that I, I, I would really like for your, um, listeners to understand kind of particularly with new home sales, uh, is there is a distinction between a developer and builder and a construction company, right? Most of the developers that, uh, I've worked with, um, do not have a construction arm within their larger kind of umbrella art organization. Most developers hire and contract a third party construction company to do the physical building, right? The physical construction uh, of the of the project. Uh, and more oftentimes than not, um, when there is an issue, it's really with the construction company, right? And the issue, again, more oftentimes than not, is there is not enough manpower in the building. There are just simply not enough bodies in the building working uh, that usually lead to, to sometimes these, these gross delays that then I have to manage expectations. With Tamor Loinab from McWilliams Ballard, Tamor is uh, one of the top new condo, new home sales agents in Washington, D.C. Um, Tamor, what do you do when you've got a building um, and the 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 first presentation is 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 popping you've got great video you've got great assets and then when the mm-hmm. project is like people are actually starting to move in other things occur yeah. um there are issues with the construction or other issues with things that aren't getting completed on time and the consumer sentiment starts to drop and and there's things in the news how do you handle that when b- new buyers are coming into your open houses or new agents are inquiring you still have to sell this project and the pro- and the problems will get taken care of. Yeah. So how do you manage that? Like, Well, I, I guess it, it's, it's a, a two-parter response. Um, among the folks who have purchased in the building, um, these are now owners, right, or soon-to-be owners. I think I've learned that the only way um, to uh, approach uh, any problems or any discontent is to be as communicative and as transparent as possible, um, whether this is... Um, something that they thought they were promised or was going to be delivered, there's, it, it's not being delivered or there's been some sort of change, or in many con- instances, uh, something has been delayed, uh, I think you have to get in front of it, right? I think you have to um, be as transparent as possible and let f- folks know as much as I know, right? Uh, I think 
I've learned in, in my career and my experience that if you level with people, they can forgive a lot. Um, but if you uh, try to keep something from them or paint a rosier picture to them than, than, uh, or, or regurgitate these very ambitious, often tentative timelines that developers and contractors give you, then you're in real trouble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then on the flip side, you know, we are transitioning right now um, to a different market. I, I call it, uh, hopefully, what we're going to see is a return to um, stabilization and a more stable market. Uh, but I do think, listen, people aren't stupid. I think you need to address the elephant that's in the room. Uh, I think what we always try to do in our business is create a sense of urgency. And if that sense of urgency doesn't exist, you have to understand why it doesn't exist and you have to figure out a way. I mean, you can't just sit on your hands and say, oh my God, this is a terrible market. You've got to then make the most compelling value proposition you can to a prospective purchaser to get them off of that proverbial fence and into your building uh, so you can make the sales happen for your clients. Um, but that's, that's essentially what I would do. I, I, I believe in just, you know, understand your market, uh, understand what the criticisms are, have uh, responses answers, solutions to those criticisms um, so you can get over whatever that hump is, whatever that sen sentiment is. Going off of that, you're obviously managing mm -hmm. buyers, buyers agents, developer, mm -hmm. you know, lenders, construction people. You're stressing me yeah, out, Matthias. So I'm thinking, how does he do it? So yeah. you mentioned a team. Yeah. How, talk to me about how the team has an impact and how team helps you. Uh, it's everything. You know, I, I think one of the greatest lessons learned in my career um, was that A, you can't be a one man show forever. You can't be a one man show and achieve the kind of success, or I, I couldn't be a, a one man show and achieve the kind of success uh, and the kind of evolution I wanted for myself and my business without the power of a team. Um, and and um, I'm thankful that you know we are a team of four. Uh, we branched out and created um, uh, Condo Nest. Uh, and again, leaning into kind of our strength uh, and our expertise, which is the condo market, and it's kind of uh, blossomed uh, from there. But one of the things that I think um, I learned far too late in, in my career um, was that, A, I couldn't do everything on my own. That if I really wanted to diversify and expand my business, I had to uh, put together um, a, a professional, competent team that I could train uh, and then delegate to them. Um, and and um, one of the things, uh, again, uh, that uh, it, it was an aha light bulb moment, uh, in new construction, uh, one of the biggest differences, I think, between new construction and general brokerage or resales is um, you have these crazy periods of feast and famine in our business, in the new sales side, right? When you are delivering, uh, say, a 200-unit building or 144-unit building, it's wonderful, right? You, you have a building that's complete and you have all of these settlements coming in. Um, but remember, there are periods of time uh, in a new, uh, new sales agent's uh, uh, life where if a building is taking three years to complete and sell out, you're not getting a dime, right, right? until the building is complete people are, are, are moving in. Uh, so the challenge for me uh, became, okay, so how do, I, how do I do this where I am consistently making money, you know? Uh, and I, I, how do I get away from these, you know, strange periods of, of, of feast and famine? And, and the way was to diversify my, my work portfolio. And part of that was the creation of Condo Nest, the creation of a team. Um, and the greatest epiphany I had was in terms of, uh, it became clear that I didn't want to be a one trick pony. I didn't want to put all of my eggs in one basket. And this one basket was the new construction, new sales side. And I wanted to expand um, the general brokerage side of my business, but I really didn't know how to. And then I realized that the answer was staring me right in the face. It was in all of these buildings that I had sold for years and years and years, but I was, not smart enough. I mean, it was 
can, when I think about it, I still get a pit in my gut because I see all the opportunities lost, frankly. Um, but all of those buildings, those 50 unit, 100, 200 unit buildings were uh, future resale opportunities for me. Absolutely. Yeah. So wait, so con is Condo Nest, um, is that like your branding for your resales? That's right. Okay. That's correct. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously a lot of these buyers for these new condo projects are coming directly to you. They're seeing the advertising uh, assets that could be on social media or wherever else, and they're going to come directly to you. So they're, they're not your client necessarily, their customer, but that's, you're the person they know. That's right. And again, if you think about it, I am the one who is cultivating a relationship with these people for six months or a year or two years, sometimes three years. So, um, Seems like a really obvious pivot. It's a, it was it was an obvious pivot, and again, I wish I had um, I, I, I wish I had clued into that and made that realization earlier. Um, but we're we're there now. There, there now. We're doing well. So. Yeah, because I was I always wondered that. Um, uh, you know, being in resale, I, I think it's pretty obvious how resale typical brokerage works. You take a listing, uh, you put out some effort and some money for marketing usually it's all we pay for everything yeah. and then when it's over there's a commission part of that money goes to a broker part of the money goes to you you have to pay out them you know all the right. invoices that you right. had etc and what's left over is your income then you got to pay the irs blah, blah, blah. you love it yeah. Yeah. um so with new sales it's similar so if you if you have a project of 200 units and you've got like 100 of them under contract but you don't have your certificate of occupancy or blah 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 you're still waiting on all of that? You're not getting a dime. Got it. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's one of the challenges. Um, and I think the other big difference between, and there are many, many similarities between the resale general brokerage side and the new sales side, but the two biggest differences are in, in, in the way you get paid or when you get paid, you know, that length of time. Uh, and then the other big difference, I think, and one of the, the strengths, uh, the appeals of uh, new sales side of things is you do, Mattia, get to be kind of the master of your domain. You know, you get to really learn the uh, the ins and outs of this building. You are the expert. You know, you after a couple of months on a project, uh, I probably know more than the developer, the architect, or the the contractor. You know, because I'm there all the time. I, I know every inch of that building. Uh, and You're so, getting all of the other weird questions that every individual <laughs> buyer will ask. Yeah, absolutely, and 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 that's nice because uh, I think you then um, you then develop a comfort and a confidence uh, that you can then impart on a prospective purchaser. So, how much of your business is resales? Uh, so where it, it's becoming a really a 50 50 split, okay. uh, which is always been the goal. And in, in fact, my goal, uh, increasingly is to manage, oversee the new side of, of, of the business. Uh, I will never leave it frankly, because it feeds, mm -hmm. uh, the general brokerage side. Um, but for me personally, uh, I would like, uh, to have a greater footprint in the general brokerage market. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so I, I'd like it to be perhaps more of a 70-30 split. 70-30 in terms of resales to new? Right. Okay. Um, what are some current trends in new construction that you're seeing? Um, maybe things that you're imparting on developers if you're coming in early on a project or that developers and um, designers are putting into like the, the larger projects? What's well, I, what I'm hoping... Uh, is that developers, uh, and, and even if I am on my own with a bullhorn, uh, is that uh, we hopefully get away from interior bedrooms, uh, we get away from miniature appliances, uh, that we don't forget that people have stuff that they bring with them. So uh, closet space, storage spaces are important. Um, if we've got a kitchen and we can throw in an island, let's put an island in, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, we'd like to kind of get back to basics because I think what has happened, uh, again, and it's all of this is kind of fueled by the financial bottom line that uh, understandably a lot of developers have, is, um, and you see it in the last decade, you, you know, when I started, 1010 mass, the, the average two bedroom was like 14, 1500 square feet. Yeah. Tell me that's, where in new construction you're going yeah, to find a 1500 square foot two now. bedroom. It just won't. doesn't exist. Similarly, when I started, I thought, you know, a 750, 820 square foot one bedroom was small. 
where in new construction are you going to find a one bedroom? That's a mansion. That's, that's right. right. That's right. Um, it, you know, and the argument is, well, you know, floor plans are more thoughtful. Um, you, there's less wasted space. But, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that, no, it's, it's because the, the, the greed of the bottom line means you do smaller spaces to maximize your profit margins and get a higher price per square foot. So I've been thinking about this post-pandemic. I think that the general buyer has changed. You know, their needs have changed. You know, mm -hmm. as we're working from home more, yeah. uh, you know, we're living more in our spaces. I think that there is a much higher appreciation for outdoor space, which we've never seen before. 100%. We're much more leaning towards the European style of, you know, we want to be outdoors. We want to eat outdoors, which is something before the pandemic we did not see. I'm wondering if you think that developers right now are talking about this, are talking about, you know, the need for dens because people want home offices, outdoor spaces uh, and all of I that. I think, Matthias, that's a great point. Uh, I think uh, in, in almost every building I have right now, the homes that sell first and for most are those homes that have outdoor space, private outdoor space, or even a balcony. You know, mm -hmm. There's a huge demand for those spaces. Buildings that will aff afford purchasers some sort of um, uh, substantial common outdoor space uh, is, is, in, is in very high demand. Um, I won't stage a unit now that won't show at the to your point about the den, but if I don't have the luxury of a den, that won't show a space where you can carve out a desk niche because the, the fact of the matter is, is um, a lot of people are working remotely, mm -hmm. and those are important. You know, mm -hmm. I have had developers reconfigure kitchens, frankly, where you create an elongated um, kitchen counter and create a desk niche within that space. You know, um, so yeah, those are realities, and and you have to be nimble enough to you know, to pivot with a design or with the way you present or stage a unit so you can meet that need. Um, just a random one. Do you know how many projects you've worked on in your career? Oh, gosh. Never tallied it up. Look at the website. No, but right now I can tell you that I'm, I'm represent four buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a lot. That's a lot. That's how a many lot units to total, like, in those four? Uh, I'll get you a calculator. No, uh, well, uh, two of the buildings uh, alone, one is 179 units, uh, another is 171 units. Uh, I've got another one that's the smaller ones, 31. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, recently we Somebody were... Somebody do the math. <laughs> recently, the Robin Brent Group and um, myself were called in to potentially take over a project, and uh, we didn't get it, unfortunately. Sorry, Mattia. Yeah. Um, but uh, the um, developer really, really wanted someone on site, like all the time, yes. like during the week, during weekday hours, when buyers probably weren't going to be mm -hmm. walking by this project. Um, I mean, we were happy to like have people ready to go to schedule appointments or maybe have shorter hours, mm -hmm. but they were really all about this, like, you know, nine to five person there. Right. Um, and I think that was a big uh, factor in who they decide to go with. What is a typical day like though? Like if you have a building, when you first open, are you there every day if it's a large project with 100 plus units? Uh, honestly, I, I would love to be there every day if there was that kind of demand. Uh, I'm not gonna sit idle at a sales office and rot, right? Mm -hmm. um, that may have worked early on mm -hmm. in my career when perhaps I didn't know better. It's just not a strategic use of my time or frankly, the developer's time. You know, somebody's paying for me being there or somebody on my team being there. I, I will not work on a project where I'm forced to be at a sales office seven days a week or five days a week because it's really an exercise in futility. It doesn't work. I think you need to be much more strategic with your time. Um, I'm so happy you said that because we were trying to explain this because the demand for this project was okay, but it didn't yeah. seem like it would be a, a proper use of time to have someone there from like nine to five during the week. I agree. I, and I, I think this is the other beauty of being where I am in my career is the, the, the freedom I'm afforded to say no to projects like that. And I don't hesitate to say no because I know it's not going to work out. Um, it, on the flip side of that, I think the client has every right to make that demand, make that request. I'm just not the right person right. for that project. It, 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 you know, it's clear. And, you know, sometimes um, there's there are ideas on paper that sound good, like you should be there, you know, seven days a week and have it. 
uh, the reality of that, it doesn't work out. And you're just throwing money away on staffing that you don't need to, frankly. What's your favorite building that you worked on and why? Uh, my favorite building is always the new one. You know, um, <laughs> good answer. Uh, no, but, Perfect answer. <laughs> but uh, honestly, my, my my favorite, and I like them all because I told you they're all there. You can't pick from your, you can't pick a favorite child. But I'm really excited about um, a building that I'm doing for the Holiday Corporation in uh, in Old Town at the corner of uh, King Street and Payne Street. Mm -hmm. um, it's a just a lovely location. It's a boutique building, 31 residences, um, and um, it just captures uh, the charm, and character, and the vibe of Old Town perfectly, and it's it's, it's really well done. It's a great location, uh, yeah, and uh, and they're a great developer mm -hmm. uh, to to work with. They do good product, um, and uh, they've made it kind of a collaborative effort. So I'm I'm very excited about that. I think that's going to be an amazing build. When's that ready? Depends on who you ask. Okay. To you. No. Um, I, again, I think developers have very ambitious timelines. Um, uh, I have a more realistic timeline. I think it's going to happen sometime first of next year. Okay. Um, we we will start hard hat tours on that project probably at the end of this month, and that's when I will begin to kind of crystallize when is this project really going to deliver? Right. Because I'll be on site. I've learned never to take again the very ambitious dates that they throw at me. Um, so I like to, to get in with the, with the GC on the project, meet up with him, you know, bi-weekly, ask him for kind of his objectives. What is he think he's going to, he's going to, uh, complete in the next two weeks, 15 days, go back two weeks from there, see how many of those items on his, uh, objective list he's, he's achieved. And that in essence tells me more about, um, the timeline and and whether or not to give credence to the the projections they give me than anything else we usually don't do like listing plugs on here but this is a little different with new condos but like do you, what's another one give us another one uh the other one that i think i'm i'm really excited about is actually the the last project Matia and i worked yeah. together on uh this is 1625 eckington place um i get asked all the time um uh, by people you know where can I get in now? You know, what is the next it neighbor, uh, neighbor, neighborhood? What's the next, you know, is Logan Circle, then Shaw, Navy Art. Uh, where can I get in now and really see my, um, my investment appreciate handsomely? And I think for me, that Eckington neighborhood in Noma really has the potential to do that. Um, there are certain developers like JBG Smith that have made such a substantial uh, investment, both on the residential front, but also on the commercial front. Um, you can see it happening. The crane activity alone in that neighborhood is jaw dropping. Um, so what I like about uh, that project in particular, uh, again, is, is the potential for that neighborhood to really boom. When I first moved to DC, I was living in Eckington and that was several years ago, but I always thought there's so much space there still, you know, yeah. in warehouses and spaces. You know, when people tell me Logan Circle, I'm like, there's no more space. Yeah. You know, where, where do you want us to build? You well, know, so I, I think it, Navy Yard and Eckington are textbook examples of how development is done. I mean, I look at Navy Yard and I'm, you know, Max and I worked at a, on a project on a deal together there at the Avidian. But um, Navy Yard, as we know it, is wholly a, a man-made, developer-made creation, you know, it, it, and it's happened in, the, I would say, the last 12, 13, 14 years. Um, there was nothing there, right? So uh, what did developers do? They made uh, big investments. They, they, they uh, put up huge buildings at a time that nobody was doing 200, 300 unit buildings. Um, but, but they put up these big rental buildings to attract a population that was priced out of the more Tony areas of Northwest. They made it affordable. They got the bodies into the building. So the population came slowly, but surely as, uh, people moved into the neighborhood, the commercial component of this neighborhood story really began to blossom. The grocery stores came in, the bars, the yoga studios, the restaurants. Uh, and, and now, I mean, it's, it's kind of been the it neighborhood in the city. Uh, and we're seeing in the last couple of years the first foray into for purchase condominium construction there. Uh, and it's become just a, a, a great dynamic neighborhood.
it's really interesting. Navy Yard, um, I was uh, showing a house there recently uh, next to Capitol Quarter, like, an, but an older townhouse. I didn't even realize there were any older houses still yeah. there. There's like one little pocket yeah. of older houses. But yeah, everything else there is like new out of the ground, like, like you were saying, very man-made developer yeah. put yeah, together. It's amazing. And yeah. I, going back to Eckington, I, I see Eckington today as where Navy Yard was maybe five, seven years yeah. ago. So I think it has that kind of potential. Good point. I, I, I agree with you. I'm working with an investor right now. She's um, looking at just random two unit houses in 2001 zip code, mm -hmm. which is just across from Eckington. And I'm like, why don't we just go across North Capitol? Yeah, I think you're going to get more bang for your buck on these. And the appreciation seems pretty obvious. I mean, especially when you say a developer like JBG, you know, putting that much money and effort into that pocket on the like sort of the back end of Eckington. Yeah. That's that's huge. huge. They're because they're yeah. they're very serious developers. So. Right. And I think what they do well, what JBG does well is they don't just put up residential buildings and hope and pray that the commercial will follow. They really attack the residential component simultaneously uh, to the the residential development. I think that's been kind of one of the, the recipes for their success. Mm -hmm. Switching gears a little bit. How do you. So you're not sitting there in a trailer all day, which is great. But from my understanding, you know, open houses, showings at all times of the day. I mean, you could be if you're taking every appointment, you could be in that building, you know, at any time of the day, at any time of the week. How do you keep your life balanced? You know, where do you find, you know, where when's your free time? <laughs> well, you know, what do you do in that free time yeah. to sort of have the energy to go back to your building? Uh, that's a great question. Honestly, I think the biggest challenge and struggle for me is finding that work life balance uh, because I'm so focused on, on, on growing. Our, our business uh, and making sure that nothing suffers as a result of uh, of our expansion, uh, that it becomes you know my my kind of control freak tendencies kick mm -hmm. in, um, but that's tough. You know, I, I I am a morning person, so I try to get up early, five or six o'clock in the morning. Uh, that's kind of my kind of sacred uninterrupted time. That's like I've got a three hour block where I can sit behind a computer and get stuff done because otherwise like you said i'm like a chicken with his head cut off yeah. running around all over the city in northern virginia from appointment to appointment right. and i'm working till till midnight essentially but i try to get some form of exercise in at nine o'clock with the exception of today because i would with you gentlemen Good. thank you but i try to do <laughs> um you know a gym a, a run a yoga become in my old age uh, a student of yoga now which i i love um and uh i've got my family here uh, you know i see my my niece and nephew i'm very involved in their lives every weekend so um we're kind of attached at the hip but you do you just i mean for your own sanity for your own balance you try to carve out something beyond your work as important as it is let's do a couple of our classic questions here um uh -oh. What's the best tech tool you're using right now for your business? Um, if, for me, this is why I bought Grasshopper here, Jordan, because I'm probably the most uh, technologically inept person I know. Um, Surprised so, to hear that, actually. Yeah. I, but uh, so what is the best tech tool, Jordan? There you go. I think Max may disagree with that, but... <laughs> It's TikTok, obviously. <laughs> TikTok. Oh God, <laughs> that's a next level. TikTok is next level. I don't really know. This how is to why use we keep much, Jordan. But I'm trying to learn. <laughs> the day I do TikTok, wow. Um, what's an important lesson you uh, might have for a new agent looking to get, to get into the business, or or maybe particularly new condo sales? Because you meet a young agent, and they're like, yeah. I want to do what you do. What would you say? You know, I, I wish I had somebody had told me this. Uh, go in with a plan, right? Go in with a blueprint. I mean, I think I meet a lot of uh, young agents and they want to do this because they think this is their get rich quick plan, right? To, to a career, to a profession, which is fine. I don't want to begrudge anyone for wanting to make money and lots of it, more power to you, but have a plan, right? Have a blueprint to how you're going to grow your business, how you're going to evolve. Uh, and think about more than just the, the money, you know, work on uh, your professionalism, learn the business, work on your competency. Um, you know, those are the big things. I, th I think um, th there are a lot of people who, uh, again, come into this business who think they're going to make a quick buck. Um, 
but they don't take the time to really cultivate their skills. Fair enough. Um, you're a little, you're still young, but do you have any idea how you'd like to be remembered in the industry? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think again, I think I uh, pride myself on being a professional. Uh, I think I'm fairly competent. Uh, and uh, I think I've always tried to be honest with people. So I, I hope people remember me for my integrity. Hey, Moore, thank you so much for coming out today and sharing all this with us. Um, Brent's not here to do rapid fire. So, Mattia, you're going to do it. You're going to do, do rapid it. fire. Uh -oh. Rapid fire. What's your guilty pleasure? Uh, it was uh, any uh, reality crap on Bravo. But I, I, I have... Uh, I've been guilted into not watching that anymore. Okay. <laughs> Who guilted you into not watching Bravo? Me, me. Oh, you me. did it to yourself. Yes, I just felt like a bad human being every time I watched one of those horrible housewife shows. That is funny. Uh, what are you currently reading or a book that you recommend? Uh, I, I, one of my favorite authors is Toni Morrison. Uh, and for whatever reason, I'd never read her first novel, The Bluest Eye. So I actually took a vacation in March, believe it or not, uh, and I read the blue star yes. and uh, it solidified her as uh, among the most masterful storytellers writers yes. i would give a limb to write like that nice right well aside from reality mm -hmm. tv show do you have a favorite show right now god i i, I can't remember the last time i really watched tv i, I loved ozark oh uh, but in my good nice. one. Yeah. pantheon of, of of favorite tv shows uh, mad men mm -hmm. Game of Thrones yeah. and Lost. Those that nice. would be kind of the trifecta Lost. for me. Uh, favorite restaurant in DC? Favorite restaurant. Uh, my spouse is going to kill me, <laughs> uh, but uh, Le Diplomat, <laughs> just because it's a block away from my home. But I also uh, really love um, Fabio Trabocchi's uh, Italian restaurants. Yeah. I love Sfalina. Um, I love Fio La Mare. Yeah. Del Mar, yeah, that's good. Um, aside from our podcast, are you listening to any podcasts right now? I don't. I only listen to Keaton. That's <laughs> good that's answer. Good answer. answer. Um, any hobbies? Um, yes. Uh, so I told you I'm, I'm getting into yoga. I, I do love to run even with these old man knees. Um, and then I have uh, live music. Uh, I've got um, I've got some great concerts. I uh, a big Brandy Carlisle fan. I get to see her live uh, in a couple of weeks. Huge Chris Stapleton fan, so I get to see him live uh, in a couple of weeks. I get to see Gladys Knight on the tenth, which I'm thrilled. She's one of my favorite voices ever. So yes. you go to a lot of shows. Yeah. I do. I, I this is the the big thing uh, that I missed most during the COVID lockdowns was being able to get out and, and hear live music. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, any predictions for 2023? I guess or end of 2022 into 2023 for yeah, real estate. I think. Look, this we're going to go back into uh, a, a, a period of market stability, right? We could not sustain these crazy escalations anymore. But I, I do also want your listeners to to know. Uh, because I feel that there is this kind of uncertainty, this panic in the marketplace. We are so fortunate to live where we live. Um, there are, uh, the population growth in this region is exponential. There are hundreds and thousands of people that flock to our region because of the, the robust job market. Um, and maybe some of those people, uh, and all of those people, remember, need a roof over their heads. They need homes, right? For a period of time, perhaps some of those people are going to retreat from the marketplace, from the, from the uh, uh, general brokerage resale new construction side and rent for a little bit. But these markets are cyclical, right? The pendulum will swing the other way when these rents get so exponentially high that people will, again, have a, a light bulb moment and say, why am I throwing this money away for rent when I could own for less? Yes. Yep. And finally, we'd like to make a donation in your honor to thank you for being with us ah. to uh, a charity. So what's your favorite charity? M Mary Center. Perfect. Yeah. That's wonderful. I didn't know that. That's yeah. fantastic.
Thanks for listening to Keyed In with your hosts, Max and Brent, unlocking the minds of the industry's top real estate professionals. For more information on selling your home, find us online at keyedinpodcast.com. Remember to subscribe to Keyed In on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Keyed In Podcast, at Raven Max, and at Brent E. Jackson. And follow Max on TikTok at Maxwell Rabin underscore properties. Oh, oh, oh.